Thank you so much, uh, Christoph, for trusting me with this humbling task. I am indeed humbled. The focus of my presentation is on the strengthening inequality in the access of online education. And uh, from what we've seen in an African perspective, the manner in which the pandemic has affected the human lives and education has, has exposed deficiencies and inefficiencies of several ways in which uh, in an African continent and even across the world is actually, uh, we're actually doing things. It, it, it has awakened us and we're noticing a sudden race of, uh, for relevance while others are in the race for survival. And those are really um, visible um, disparities between those who are transitioning smoothly into the new world order from conduct to digital that is actually enforced without us having a choice by the conditions of the pandemic and in compliance with the regulations of staying at home, quarantine, social distancing, and so forth. But when we look at it from South African perspective, just pandemic on its own, as we might be um, have to consider the issues of equal access to online education, the first problem in most of the, um, African countries is not the worry whether I have access to online education, it's the worry of what is my next meal. Speaking to poverty as one of the subject matters of this session within the cyber uh, space of ethical learnings. And then the other challenge would be is on gender issues. I wonder if God will I be able to wake up alive in this home that the president has said I must stay in that is a prison to me because I am with a perpetrator that I'm scared to take to SAPS and it has manifested itself a lot in the South African um, in South Africa in the country with escalating fast escalating reports of gender based violence cases just on the first week, the first few weeks uh, since the lockdown, they, they scattered to almost 80, 47,000 within the first two or three weeks. And that has shown how much um, gender based violence has uh, and other gender issues that affected the lockdown. And um, in some countries, then it could have been the issue that now the economy had to be closed while people have to consider the fact that the country on its own had job creation issues. But be that as it may, we don't want to dwell much on what the pandemic has done in general, but looking at the cyber ethical issues that we have learned from it. We've noticed the issue of trust, access, availability of data, the integrity of the data that is available and its usage the notions of confidentiality and privacy, security and accuracy, and interpretation and actually embracing the ethical principles in the constitution, in particular the South African constitution to be specific. Um, we, when we talk about the data that is, is available and its usage, in practice it kind of interpreted to falsification of information that is shared false news and false information and teachings on what the actual pandemic is about, what we need to do to actually cap it or address it or take care of ourselves. And that has manifested in certain behaviors that we have noticed of this stigmatization where the first patients that got to be um, cases of the pandemic feel stigmatized by the very health professionals that they were hoping that they should protect. And now we, was it the issue of the true information? It was the data has had the data had its own integrity? Was the available data to the people, the data that should have been available? And are people having enough access? And then how can they trust it if ever it's not perceived to be as accurate as, as, as it should be from the cyber space to the people and the community at large? And if ever we were to apply now into this space of um, um, cyber um, ethics and also the access of an, um, into inline education, can we say that in general it has actually shown us whether we are saying that broadly terms, are we in an ethical state of um, living 
or not, but if we were to look into Bentham, a hedonist and utilitarian, when they define ethics in this state as it's where a situation is actually providing the good for the biggest number, while maybe paying if there is one is for the smallest number, then we are actually experiencing a high imbalance of the ethical essence of the world in an African country. We have mostly those who are benef who have the, that have resources, the haves, that have the access to online, um, access to online education. We've got the biggest number that I have not, that do not have access to online education. And that is probably not even the first thing in their mind. Maybe the first thing in their mind is, will I be able to eat? The studies, I'll see them later. And the other one in their mind is that, will I survive today if I go back home? And the soldiers and police are here. They want me to uh, oblige the regulations of uh, staying at home and, and, and social distances, but my problems, are, I feel like my problems are bigger than that. And this, uh, when you're looking into the notion of poverty, we, uh, we notice, you can notice that the poverty will not be just the lack of resources for people to have access to online education. It will be also linked to the lack of knowledge on how to use the resources. Um, let me take it personally. Uh, it's been 22 years since I matriculated. When I got to, I passed my matric while I went to a university, first day inside the computer lab in the cyberspace, very first time, and I'm 18 years old. The tutor or the lecturer said, this is a computer lab with this computer in front of you. You've got a mouse next to you. Personally, I've got phobia of reds, of which I call the mouse. And now I jump on top of the table because I did not know the black thing that removes the cursor in the computer is a mouse. Now, the solutions is we don't want another Zebu in the near future. We don't want another African child in the near future not having access to online education. We don't want another African child not to have, not to know what to do with the resources that are provided. And we don't want an African society that damages schools and destroys the very gadgets that are good for the future and the education of the future leaders of the continent. So we're calling now for solutions that in order to bridge that perceived and observed inequality on access to online education in an African perspective is that the same blue chip companies, multinational companies and philanthropies and humanitarians that are affording, we are calling upon them to consider redefining their corporate social responsibility and their corporate social investment and the license to operate is maybe now is to consider broadly contributing to resources that will ensure access to online education because we might not go back to the old normal. We might be venturing into the new normal, the new world order that we just have to adapt maybe on it, that we cannot change, but move forward as we are alive and surviving on it. So now it's not only up to those blue chip companies. The education does not start in higher education. We start with the basic education from grade R up until metric, some I call it all levels in other countries. It is also the duty of higher education to consider trying to ensure what mechanisms can we put in place in relation to the experiences and the culture that is in basic education on access to online education so that we can avoid the idea and the future inheritance of the type of students that will be struggling so much when they got into higher education. But that does not only end up in there. It moves to the issue of gender. In terms of gender, when you look into from the African context, I, I, I remain to be corrected, I remain to be critiqued, as I'm not a gender expert, but in looking with the, um, the ethical issues and relations to the equality, if ever there is access on uh, equality on access to online education, it, it, it goes back to the social constructionism that define the gender priorities and gender uh, duties that has actually created the mending the disparities in between two genders of male and female and their responsibilities. 
uh, Professor Meyiwa from the University of South Africa has said something along these lines in the news recently, this beginning of this week, if not last week, highlighting uh, the fact that maybe um, we might need to, as women, as compared to men, understand that as much as research has shown in the previous years that IT related, um, if ever you're an IT guru, it's questionable, raise his eyebrow, oh, a lady, you're doing IT. Even in the previous uh, enrollment statistics of um, um, previous studies, you'll find that health science, educational science, management science is good when the female is there, but when the female is on computer engineering, ICT related, um, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, when it's actually a female, it gets to be uh, questioned or raising eyebrows. Those are the things that with us as individuals without knowing have socially constructed and made it acceptable. Then we need to look upon ourselves and say, can't we deconstruct what is socially constructed as acceptable as to what gender should do with duty at home and at work, uh, considering that the new normal might require us to work from home, then a home might not be where a woman must is expected to wear a pinif and cook, but it's still the same place that must have an office and for one to allocate time to office related duties. Um, I did not dwell much on gender, but if ever, what we have noticed is that in terms of uh, just to close now cyber going back to the cyber ethics is that with the reactions as the pandemic came into the country and the continent we had to come into terms of what the biologist says that now we need to understand some rights can be superseded considering the circumstances the right to life and the responsibility to take care of the other came forth we had to find ourselves moving out of the comfort zone as trusting what is provided to us informa with information, knowing that my right to freedom can pack a little bit while assisting my right to life and another person's right to life. I cannot uh, proceed and uh, vow with my right to freedom if it suppresses another one's right to life. Um, I'll end it there for now. Thank you.